that we want to share today. Um, I am really happy to welcome on the panel Mr. Aram Agarwal, who represents the Department of Telecom and the Indian Ministry. Um, he has been the leading voice when it comes to deployment of IPv6 and the initiatives that the Indian government has taken. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal, for taking the initiative and for joining us today. I am really happy and pleased to welcome Dr. Govind, who is a senior director and has headed e-infrastructure initiatives in India and is the CEO of NICSI, which is the National Internet Exchange. There are many initiatives that NICSI is taking, and especially to address the problem of multilingualism and to create solutions. Thank you, Dr. Govind, for being with us. Thank you for making the time. I am equally pleased to welcome Mr. Vikram Tavatya, ever the gentleman, a fine voice when it comes to leading industry representation, um, the person who is the nodal contact for cellular operators, and they only just represent 840 million people. That's a lot when it comes to numbers, but the kind of diversity that you bring together and the finesse with which you lead us. Thank you, Vikram, for making the time to share these stories with us here today. Um, Dr. Hiroshi Isaki, who is the Executive Director of the IPv6 Promotion Council, also joins us. He's had great interaction with the India Story. He's the Director of the Japan Data Center since 2009 and has visited us us often and is sharing uh, the IPv6 deployment and is helping India take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saki, for joining us. I'm also really happy and pleased to welcome Sanjaya, who is with the ethnic operations and is the services director, the member of the ethnic team. Um, a lot of regional diversity. We hope that you can inform this discussion with your perspective. Um, I, I hope I haven't left anyone out. We, we also, um, no, um, there is one person certainly on the panel who needs no introduction. I think the world knows you, Mr. Bhatia. Thank you for making the time. We have on the panel Mr. Virat Bhatia, who represents the largest and the oldest industry association in India. He's also with at and looks at public policy, and has been leading conversations as far as inclusive platforms on internet and governance are concerned, bringing uh, different stakeholders together. I do want you to share, Virat, the experiences that we've had with the IIGC and the other initiatives that the industry is leading. Um, in the audience also, we have many distinguished speakers and panelists. I do want to invite you to make interventions, questions, and comments. It's an open session. Um, we like to call it the open forum. Please do inform this debate and lighten it with your comments, observations. Uh, I now request Mr. Aram Agarwal to please share the India story. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Subhi Chaturvedi. Let, uh, let me um, uh, introduce Ms. Subhi, of course, who has introduced all of us, but uh, not to ourselves. She is, of course, a well, well-known name in the IGF of Bali, and, of course, uh, she is a professor in uh, one of the most leading um, college of Delhi University. This is Lady Shiram College, and she is very, very active in the India Telecom Network as well as the Internet Governance. And, of course, I am really thankful um, uh, to Ms. Um, Subhi. Uh, for handling this very, very important job. Of course, uh, very good morning to you all. I welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Telecommunications, uh, uh, Government of India. Basically, as you know, India, I think, is the most um, um, democratic country, having more than 1.2 billion uh, population. And of course, it is one of the largest country uh, in the world who is having second largest mobile phones, more than 900 million uh, mobile phones. But uh, how we have been reached to this place, uh, we have been very much uh, active participant, contributor and beneficiary of the um, uh, ICT developments, revolutions since mid-90s. In, uh, if I remember very, very well, in 1994, uh, first uh, national telecom policy was announced. That time we do have only uh, 1%, less than 1% uh, uh, telecom density in India, and now it is uh, more than 75 percent telecom density. Of course, this uh, urban world uh, divide exists today. It has narrowed down. But at the same time, uh, we do have um, uh, only 150 million people online. That is a challenge with us. How we, uh, we need to catch up with the mobile connections as far as our online connections are concerned. So. Uh, definitely, Government of India have taken many initiatives, many policy decisions, but certain challenges are also there. 
so the challenges we are trying to um, focus on it we are trying to solve it but definitely it's a opportunity for the world it's a opportunity for the industries to come in india and invest in india so definitely we would like to tell you ki what the policy initiatives what are the different policy decisions have been taken in recent past so that um, those challenges uh, have been resolved or resolved so first of first and foremost is the in uh, taking the national telecom policy is the national optical fiber network i think uh, everybody is very well aware of i need not to tell it it's a um, uh, augmentation of the optical fiber network by the department of telecommunications utilizing uh, universal service obligation funds uh, basically department is taking 5% universal service uh, obligation fund from the service providers and again investing it for the development of the rural area so again it's a people's fund which is going to the uh, people's network and it is going to create a, uh, more than 600 million broadband connections by 2020 and it is Uh, going to uh, have leverage for many many more applications e government things and smart things in future so here comes the um, uh, vendors here comes the industries uh, scope for invest in india so that is the first and foremost initiative by taken by the department of telecom so that uh, by year 2017 we do have about 175 million broadband connections and by 2020 we, ta- we have targeted around 600 million uh broadband connections so these are the broadband connections not internet connections not online connections so definitely um, this target to achieve 1 billion online connections in very near future of course it is the open forum which will be discussing when we can achieve it and of course uh, the at most the foremost thing which i anticipate uh, in having uh, online connectivity not only for the persons but for the devices but for the things and of course for this uh, government of india have taken initiatives to bring our uh, devices to bring our all the items on the earth uh, online and for that uh, with the help of the industry government uh, is now in the uh, under the process of formulation one policy and i am very thankful to all the industries for all the persons who are involved into this and i i, I must appreciate uh, i must uh, um, say ki this is the real multi stakeholders process it is not government is sitting in the room and taking some policy decisions we involve all the multi stakeholders in this process in this evolutions and certain very very important inputs uh, have come to us and of course uh, uh, until and unless uh, our ip addresses Uh, are there we cannot achieve the target of 1 billion online connections ip tra- ipv6 transition from ip4 is a must for any country for all the countries and the government has already taken a lead in 2010 uh, uh, itself when releasing first road map and now to 2013 uh, we have released one ipv6 deployment road map version 2 which have set the target for india to go on ipv6 going on ipv6 never means ki we will be having only ipv6 it's a coexistence of ipv6 along with the ipv4 so complete government as well as private sectors are going to be on b6 in next 3 years time that is a timeline given by the government of india and definitely for having uh, uh, this thing we need to adopt we need to have all the partners of the ecosystems um, uh, online so we are trying to get Uh, they are ready and we are trying to have uh, systems ready by in next 3 uh, years time and uh, department have taken lead uh, with the department of electronics and information technology and our regulator uh, telecom regulatory authority of india to bring cloud services um, policy formulation in the country which may uh, solve so many issues privacy security online transactions and of course intra border transactions also but these are some of the initiatives and as india is a power deficient country so definitely we need to go in for some green uh, technologies revolutions the department we have already come out some uh, mandate for green technology solutions and uh, we have mandated ki by 2015 Uh, around 50% of the rural towers and 25% of the urban towers would be on um, green technologies so uh, 
and so and so forth so many initiatives have been taken by government of india but definitely we uh, we are seized of the issues also devices affordability of the um, uh, and, uh, networks spectrums these are some of the issues which we need to uh, address in the forum and we need to see ki how these can be addressed and how others can associate with the uh, government with india to um, uh, so that uh, 1 million connections can be achieved uh, at a early stage thank you very much thank you mr agarwal um for those of us who are still discovering the igf this is truly a reaffirmation of the multi stakeholder process here is the indian government presenting their perspective at this amazing platform with that i turn to you vikram um 850 mobile telephones and many more going counting about 200 million people who are keypad literate i had uh, my chemist requesting me to whatsapp my prescription to him so that he could send the medicines across more mobile phones than toilets in india it is a wonderful story as far as telecom is concerned as far as internet access is concerned however the itu reports reads the internet penetration to be at 11.4% what are the challenges that you see as someone who sees many more people coming online um on mobile phones more than anything else thank you subhi uh, well as part of the cellular operators and as she mentioned earlier so we've got about 700 million people who are our member subscribers so the challenge right now is from the 160 million uh, to expand that uh, ac internet access on the existing 700 build it up from 160 to 700 so clearly uh, you know the point is that in india the dominant network is a wireless network so in many other parts of the world uh, internet flows through uh, the wireline network especially when it comes to higher capacities that network doesn't exist so it will be wireless access and mobile broadband uh, that is going to en enable uh, the people beyond the 160 million to the 700 or to the 900 and then to the billion now the challenges thereby are at the pipe through which the data is to flow obviously is the spectrum and the number of people or the number of operators who utilize that spectrum so the good news is as late as yesterday the telecom regulatory authority has uh, responded back to the department of telecom on paving the way up for the next round of spectrum auctions so clearly because the internet is the killer app as far as uh, mobile internet uh, or uh, data services on the mobile goes and particularly we see that the uptake of uh, 3g or data services leading up to the uptake of the internet uh, then is the quality of experience that they get now the quality of experience again goes back to the spectrum issue so i'll uh, i'll leave it at that but the more important thing is that the interaction that an individual especially uh, the non english speaking people who will use the internet while india is lucky to have a very large uh, english speaking population but nevertheless uh, the internet continues to remain very english uh, uh, dominated so there is a lot of emphasis on trying to get more local language as to be had mentioned that on our currency notes you got at least 16 of them so more of the local language and what we as operators are seeing you know as a take off Uh, in terms of new technology voice recognition which is being used uh, a lot i i presume on the transcript that seems to be happening so uh, if we could have a non english speak uh, speaker speak into his phone and get a response over what he wants to look at the internet is something that that is in the future let's as part of the challenge that needs to be addressed as we go along important thing is that uh, we see is that why would a person want to use the internet over a mobile phone firstly it has to be simple the other thing that we see a lot uh, that would get encouraged is the 
big emphasis of the government of India on the national identity project. That's the Aadhaar project. So uh, when an individual wants to do a digital transaction over the mobile internet, a fundamental requirement is identity. So that identity will be significantly enabled as we go along through the Aadhaar and we are in, uh, in conversation with the government to allow EKYC. So at this stage, I'll leave it at that. If we address some of these issues, I'm sure the mobile operators in India will uh, scale up quickly from the 160 internet users in India uh, uh, 160 million, all right, I missed out the million, I, 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 all figures we're talking in millions. And just to, you know, uh, to sign off for the moment, uh, only one state in India, that's Uttar Pradesh, is 206 million people. Uh, by itself is the sixth biggest country in the world. Uh, so uh, that's the scale that we are looking at. So uh, uh, the efforts have to match that kind of scale, right? Okay, so be, uh, that's it for now. Thank you. As far as numbers go, that's, there's really no discussion point there. I come from Uttar Pradesh. Yes, we're all swimming in numbers. Um, I do want to turn next to Dr. Govind. As far as multilingualism, India is a cataclysm, a universe by itself. There are so many challenges in terms of multiple languages because local content does drive more people to the net. We use it for entertainment. We use it for business. We use it for e-commerce. Um, the the, how, what are the initiatives that you see from the Indian government who are creating a device interface to support regional languages? Thank you, Sobhi. <coughs> it's a great uh, opportunity to be here for connecting a billion online and learnings and the opportunities for the world's largest democracy. As the next billion is going to be from the Asia-Pacific, I talked in the morning session here, and, uh, and the need for is to use harness the ICT to deliver significant benefits to the countries underprivileged and those residing in the rural areas who represent over 70 percent of our population. Our aim has been to promote such ICT innovation that can impact lives and lead to a more inclusive society. The challenges that we are facing in India are many. The challenges of addressing poverty, illiteracy, unemployment, health care for millions, bridging the rural, urban and regional divides, achieving an inclusive growth that leads to sustainable development. The government has initiated several policies aimed at meeting these challenges. In the context, it is necessary to mention the triad of policies that ministry has brought out recently, the telecom policy, the ICT policy, and the electronic policy. Since Subhi asked me to go into the more multilingual aspects, my other colleagues must have talked about the access and security aspects. So India is a great country with a 22 official languages and use of computers is fast spreading, not only in to create employment in IT sector, but also to support productive use of IT in the daily life, increasing productivity and competitiveness, provide better quality of life, enable inclusiveness and strengthen democ democracy and more inclusive society because unless the internet has to spread into the more local languages. And in this regard, we have done two aspects which is significant. One is in the URL of the domain name to put the local languages. Like we have put uh, eight local languages right now, delegated from ICANN, which are Hindi, Bengla, Telugu, Tamil, Punjabi, Urdu, and all the uh, Gujarati. So these are the most talked about languages in the country, which covers around maybe 80 percent of the population right now. And we are moving towards more such local languages in the URL, like, like dot, instead of dot INC, CTLD, we are going to have dot Bharat in many of these languages. So that is the one aspect of multilingualization of the internet, where the URL, the first thing with the, any user looks at is the, how the URL looks like if it is in English then you know it will be difficult for him to understand what, how to spell that and how to input that kind of URLs in the, into the domain names. So the second aspect is the multilingualization in the content aspect, how the various contents in the local languages can be spread out 
and for that our one of the premier society in the country which is attached to the ministry the center for development of advanced computing which is doing the language part and its mission is dissolving language barriers to place the power of computing and e contents in the hands of the people of india and in this effort they have done a very wonderful work in the multilingual computing allied areas like speech processing speech recognition speech synthesis natural language processing machine translation information extraction and retrieval optical character recognition indian languages indian language and online handwriting recognition fonts data processing tools standardized standardization in the localization benefiting e governance space idn and email id in the local languages transliteration among indian languages so these are the some of the efforts or some of the activities or technological aspects which are going to enable the common man or the person who doesn't know the english in the internet can enable or empower himself or herself for the sake of moving forward in the multilingual space of the internet and there lies the next billion it is not only the challenge from the access point of view but also from the language barrier because language is the next important aspect which needs to be cultivated into internet to be spreading like machine translation the information extraction there are various tools and technologies which i am not going into detail which is available on the websites of the cdac the government of india website and they have done a tremendous job and they have done the most of the fonts the keyboard enabling and the recognition of these languages from the national perspective they have done all the work on these 22 official languages and the spreading of the tools and the middleware and the idn aspect i think we are there in the icann team of the idn variant tables where uh, with the languages come the variant challenges because the multiple languages can have a variant uh, scripts so that you know how to resolve or those kind of issues so a lot of work is going on in the country at the moment to resolve and multilingualization of the internet from the tools and technologies perspective thank you thank you dr govin that was indeed really exhaustive we also have you can you can use your favorite search engine and get online and look at nixie's various other initiatives as the igf is known to speak in acronyms we shall refrain from it we will make all possible efforts to refrain from using acronyms um the nofn which is the national optic fiber cable um or the initiative that is being led by the ministry is something that leads us to the heart of the matter when we look at the state versus market debate we've been talking in terms of many zeros but every single number in those zeros is equally important i now turn to you virat um uh, if you could talk about the industry perspective and also how this network this optic fiber cable network which is also something that we know as as follow the fiber will empower rural self local governance at the grassroots level and connect more people thank you zubi i will uh, keep it short so i can yield most of my time to the um, delegates and they can ask questions and participate but very quickly when the liberalization program began in india on telecommunications in 1995 uh, just by way of numbers we had one phone per 100 population today after about 18 years we have approximately 75 phones per 100 people um give or take depending on how many phones are active that week uh, we also had about 1000 um um uh, um uh, people for one phone in the rural uh, part of india so 1000 people had access to one phone this is roughly the number that came through today 40% of the rural population have access to a mobile phone so over the last um 18 years where access is concerned um and at least the aspect of more people being able to speak to other people part of the free speech is concerned a lot more people are speaking to each other the total numbers right now are about 850 million um active um subscriptions um, but we have remained at about this number for the last 2 years or so so what the government did was it took um the monies that consumers had paid into the uso fund using mobile telephony to redirect it for online connectivity the business case for mobile telephony india is actually quite spectacular it's done reasonably well the business case for 
online connectivity like most other developing countries is not as good and as as fast developing and even though mckinsey expects that our 160 million mobile connections will go up to about 320 million with the help of the efforts that isps and mobile operators are putting in nearly 90 percent of those connections will come through mobile internet um, and in that um, the question then is how do you lay the basic structure for transferring traffic across the country since the wireless spectrum is insufficient to do that and is sort of in different pockets and that's when the country came up and the government along with the consultation with the industry and other stakeholders came up with the idea of the national fiber optic network also known as no fun um, and uh, um, that um, project then uh, is deploying um, um, network to augment the existing infrastructure in the country and new infrastructure to build essentially with the aim of connecting 250,000 plus district headquarters once the internet traffic reaches those points then through wireless connectivity and local service providers and more ISPs who are very active in small areas we hope to provide connectivity to the rural and the unserved part of India and that's the reason why the connections seem to go up is a question yesterday about how will this help sustainable development how will online connectivity help the poorest of the poor is very similar to the question that we were being asked when um, mobile telephony was first liberalized in 1995 when it was um, literally a fashion statement to carry a mobile phone today plumbers fishermen um, domestic help the poorest of the poor at least in urban India carry a mobile phone sometimes two mobile phones one by way of a sim card in the back pocket so we think that to answer your question this tremendous uh, public finance program which is using consumer funding of the USO fund into building the fiber optic network is perhaps the most eloquent example of a multi-stakeholder engagement because mobile operators in the private sector will be involved in actually building out the last mile the consumers have been involved in actually funding this through the USO fund which the government has carefully collected and now is deploying in a very sensible way by changing the laws the civil society and NGOs will be involved deeply because once you get the connectivity to the rural parts of India then the NGOs come in to help rural Indians come online either through providing one person who can bring a community in the rural self-governance areas to download e-governance content or content for filing applications or land records and so NGOs have a very strong role small businesses have a very strong role the academia will have a really strong role because they will constantly analyze how the development of this network has gone in so somewhat unlike the telecommunications expansion which was a, a experience between an experiment between the private sector and the government that went really well uh, and we have amazing access stories the online penetration is going to be a true multi-stakeholder engagement with government consumers who are contributing to the fund private sector who will provide the last mile academia who will put out the papers and the analysis and the civil society and NGOs who will really provide inputs into how the last mile connectivity can be used for enhancing free speech for providing access to don't those who don't have access to government information and also um, I think India will I'll close it just 30 seconds India will jump from illiteracy to digital literacy rather than go from illiteracy to literacy to digital literacy there's going to be this magical I, I think uh, transition as it happened in case of mobile phones where people are not able to read or write English but they can use English keypads to send you messages in Hindi and that's about 200 million Indians who can do that so there is a transition that is going to occur uh, quite quickly as we go beyond 200 million subscribers of the illiterate becoming digitally literate rather than go through the whole literacy program which takes about 15 years we can't build enough schools fast enough in brick and mortar we can't put enough hospitals fast enough we can't have sufficient primary health centers fast enough so the online connectivity to rural India will allow knowledge transfer online for schools 
with teachers and high quality lectures being delivered in the centers of the country and international portions and then being telecast in local languages with multilingual software that is being discussed, x-rays being examined, primary health being delivered, advice being delivered online. So we believe that poverty reduction, which is a main millennium goal and is a key objective of the government, of the private sector and something that everybody is participating in, will be served in ways that are unparalleled in the next five to seven years as India touches about uh, 600 million broadband connections um, as per the national telecom policy. So that's the uh, process of multi-stakeholder engagement and those are the benefits that we believe will go down to the bottom of the pyramid where everybody can start being connected either themselves or to somebody who can put them on online. Thank you. Thank you, Virat. Um, I think. There's a question in the back. Sure. Um, yes, of course. Um, um, I will shamelessly plagiarize from you. You've just come back from India. Let me invite uh, someone who we very fondly know and remember as the modern day Voltaire, Mr. Bertrand Chappelle. Um, you've, just, you've just come back from India. It would be wonderful if we can take your question and if you could also share briefly how your India experience was. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to make a very brief question to, to what Virat said. It is indeed a rare situation where mobile and fixed seem to go better hand in hand. Is it because reaching out to rural and um, providing the fiber is actually increasing the backbone for the mobile network itself and that there is a sort of mutual interest that was recognized in order to make the mobile network leveraging the physical infrastructure faster? Or what is the reason why it worked to have this combination of the two dimensions working uh, collaboratively? Actually, um, Vikram could also respond to that. But I think it's, uh, I'll just come short because the other speakers and we can come to this. I think it's a combination of the fact that the, the voice business is done exceedingly well to rural India. The online business, which is more content and uh, you know structured business, that, that that because of the cost of devices, smartphones, wireless devices, and the bandwidth available is is not that easy to get out. So, what the government did very cleverly and very I think very smartly is to transition money that was for rural voice, which got delivered anyway because of the connectivity, 40% connections. Uh, into online um, connections, the fixed network, which can carry large bandwidths, and then use the mobile infrastructure that exists with sharply declining prices of mobile devices, smartphones, which is happening now. We heard yesterday about the $80 phone, which can take almost all features. Um, and that, we believe, will really change. I mean, there are many steps that have to occur parallelly, and they are occurring because technologists and the technical community, which I didn't mention, and I should have, are going to play a very important role to drop the prices of access and the prices of smartphones and wireless devices, such as Akash that the government is working on, which will then allow this. So it's, it's a, it's a need-based um, uh, partnership that is actually, um, I think, we believe will work really well. I think Virat set the stage perfectly for me to call on to my next speaker. As a distinguished academic, and I think what academics do wonderfully well is to read, write, and research. Um, uh, I, I now call on Mr. Hiroshi Isaki, who is from the University of Tokyo and is familiar with the India story. So I think Japan has led the conversations when it comes to broadband, M2M technologies and smartphone penetration. The government did get it right. What are the learnings and what are the challenges, obstacles and solutions that you see for the India story? Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, regarding the question, the previous question, basically we have the uh, real data about the internet traffic more than 10 years. Then about, you know, uh, two years ago, until two days ago, the major portion was by wired infrastructure. Wireless was very small, ignorable when we designed the backbone net network. 
Now, within two years, the percentage of the uh, wireless data communication going increased significantly. Then about 10% of the traffic came from data wi wireless communication. That is in, in real, real data set, you know, a, a lot of data communication by the high-speed wi wireless infrastructure is, is coming, which providing the big impact into the backbone network. That is the uh, state of art in you know, Japan status regarding wireless and wired traffic status. Um, when we go into the uh, Japanese case, which would be shared uh, among, among us, would be uh, Japan has the uh, new IT strategy, now, actually this year. Um, this covering many speakers, as mentioned, e-government, for, for example. Um, the target of that is the uh, ministries of Japanese government is totally separated. They never share the data. They never you know, expose the data. That is the reason why uh, we define the open government, let data to be exposed uh, um, to the, uh, you know, uh, to, to the uh, you know, private sectors or, 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 or other open, open data. That is one of the important messages we are sending to the, the Japanese countries. Uh, as showing the government is one of the exam one of the le reference example to showing such you know uh, possibilities. Along that, the other important uh, mission or strategy defined in Japanese government was every industry should go to the digital native revolution. Uh, mostly, we are focusing on agriculture, healthcare, ed education and the other, you know, uh, critical infrastructures. So that is the, uh, our, you know, uh, responsible areas going to increase. The government, you know, are clearly saying uh, those are the important next steps that Jap Japan should, should have. Because, you know, ja Japanese I I internet penetration rate is more than 85% in these days. So, uh, you know, we have already did the IP for everyone in these days. So now we are going to the IP for everything. Everything means the, not only the device, but also all of the uh, you know, uh, private sectors, structures or infrastructures should go into the online. Along that, <clears throat> um, for example, uh, from, from now until 10 years, largest UTT company in Japan, Tokyo UTT company, is going to install 27 million smart meter based on internet pro protocol, especially IP version 6. All of meter is going to be connected through the wireless infrastructure. So the reason why we having such infrastructure is we have to have very secure um, energy supply system against any incident. As you know, Japan has the uh, great tsunami, also the quite serious situation about nu nuclear plant. So uh, everybody starts to realize we have to have very sustainable, you know, reliable infrastructure using IT technologies. Of course, energy saving or uh, environmental protection would be the one on the topic, though we really realize that is important for the, uh, you know, for Japan, as well as the emerging country, especially when I, when I visit frequently in India, you have many new construction, building a new, new city, which means you can build the brand new, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure from the beginning, which is a very totally smart city, smart building, smart campus you could do. So uh, that, that is, I really share, share with you that one of the things. The other strategical action or activities the uh, Japanese people, Japanese government are doing is cyber security for such a critical infrastructures. Um, we have special team which can hack, for example, this convention center. How much time you, you need in order to hack this convention center? Probably just three minutes. It's not a joke. We tested using one of the large complex in downtown Tokyo. We successfully hacked that building in about three minutes. Same as professional factories. Same as, you know, uh, transportation system. 
they never think about security at this time. So that is one of the important things when we develop the uh, new infrastructure based on the uh, internet connectivity or internet-based technology, especially when the system has wireless connectivity inside the uh, system, which has the very serious you know, um, importance on the security. So that is the, we have to think about when we are making uh, this particular situation. So uh, this is the, uh, now, now we are doing in Japan. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think that is really what we want to do here as part of the Open Forum, bring in as many voices as the, from the region as we can. And with that, I turn to you, Sanjay, who represents APNIC, five regional registries, many different conversations. How is it that we can get them to talk to each other and what is the traffic growth pattern that you see coming from India and any other inputs that can inform the debate and the discussion on the India story and the way forward? Thanks, Subi. Um, let's talk about the traffic first. So we probably all read the uh, Cisco's report back in June that uh, the compound growth rate of the Indian internet traffic is like 44%. That's really massive, probably the highest in the world. And then, um, you know, there will be like 33 exabytes of traffic by 2017, which is sixfold what you have right now. So, and, and, and I kind of know where it's coming from. I just had a discussion with, uh, with my colleagues here in Indonesia, and uh, again referring to the Cisco report that uh, in 2017, probably 60% uh, of the traffic will be on video. Now, listening to the previous speakers that uh, part of the problem, especially in the rural area in the India, is illiteracy, then, you know, video could be a solution because nowadays it's so much natural growth from just voice into video and there's so much more information that can be conveyed through video uh, for people to learn. So I think uh, uh, it's something that you might want to, to look at seriously. Um, as for IPv6, I'm afraid <laughs> We still <laughs> in this, uh, have uh, some work to do, but I, I understand that Aram Agdal is working really hard on this, particularly the Indian government taking lead on this. So we're, of course, the APNIC uh, would support uh, your work here. Um, learning from the other part of the region, I don't think... Uh, it's very hard to compare with the rest of the region because of your unique condition. You know, you're, you're the massive number of people. The closest we can probably compare is, is probably with China because you're about the same size and so on. But the political uh, is, uh, uh, situation is completely different. So again, it's very, very hard. So I, 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 I think the solution to the Indonesian uh, issue would be best designed by uh, by Indian is would be best designed by the the Indian uh, people. You you know what what's needed, and I think you have all the brain to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. That was very very precise and a lot of food for thought. Um, I do want to before I bring in some conversations from across the floor. Virat, could you quickly come in on that one? Staggering numbers there. What is the industry doing? So much more traffic. Actually, uh, I could, I could, but I think the president of the Internet Service World Association, uh, Mr. Sharia, is here. I think I'd invite him to comment on, you know, how he sees this growing in the subscriber base because they're sort of on the ground serving customers. So I'd sort of defer to him for his comments. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Virat. 600 million broadband connection will not be possible till the time we are not bridging the gap between the rural and the urban. Everybody into the panel has spoken about the English. English is a big challenge in India. We require a friendly application. In spite 950 million of mobile connection into India, still 
most i will say most of the rural person is knowing the green button for the dialing and red button for the disconnecting nothing else no sms nothing they know that one number is of my daughter two number is of my uh, son that's the memory which has been faded by somebody else on their behalf another major thing what the rural india is requiring hand holding lot of e governance application indian railway ticketing prepaid recharge everything is being done online and everything is being required hand holding and the isps who are serving into the niche market are doing this very very good job into this area no doubtly 6% percent, 6 Uh, ISPs are capturing 95 percent, but rest of the 144 ISPs who are catering to the 5 percent are really serving to the rural area, and that's the beauty of these ISPs. We must consider the government initiative, Bharat Broadband Network Limited, for bridging the gap between the rural and urban, but also National Knowledge Network. for connecting all the universities and professional colleges and schools to a single network so that they should get the content and in this field the dit has done a great job by putting this nkn network as well as the earnet network sanjay you are right that the video is the killer application and literacy illiteracy can be resolved by this video because when we are not able to send our sms to our known people at least we can send the video messages to them and we will be able to communicate in a better way and the 60% what uh, you are predicting is absolutely right because right now if you see that the major hits of the internet is going on the video like the youtube nixi along with the ispi has created a lot of exchanges and that to keep the indian data india because we are spending a lot of money the foreign currency to the international bandwidth and i hope the more we will use of the nixi the more cost will come down and the user experience in downloading the data will be much more better because the holding time of the internet connection will be less if the data is hosted locally and these are the some issues or i will say the success story of the indian broadband and the indian internet industry and very soon the same way what the mobile has taken over 950 million and now they are going to touch 1 billion we will touch 1 billion faster than the mobile i can assure thank you mr charya um i think it outlines some challenges and also positive stories i do want to now bring in a, a distinguished voice who's also been familiar with india about 8 years of uh, the indian experience ambassador gross i call on you now to share how is it that you've seen the india transform into this amazing network of networks Well, thank you very much, and it's a great honor and a privilege to be here with uh, this extraordinary panel. And uh, I think the importance of India and the changes that have occurred in the area of ICT is illustrated by how uh, the large turnout uh, against a lot of other very interesting uh, events at the same time. So I think that's really quite uh, quite telling. Uh, I don't think uh, we have enough time to go into the sorts of uh, catalog of uh, reasons behind your uh, your kind statement but let me just say that i think there are a number of things that have uh, been truly extraordinary um, in the past and i think uh, for tell a very positive future for india in this area uh, one of course is a uh, a commitment to uh, open markets competition uh, unleashing the extraordinary entrepreneurial a uh, power of the indian people uh the government made some very conscious changes the indian government made some conscious changes uh, a number of years ago that has set i think the indian economy on a new and very vigorous and exciting path and that obviously has uh, had an effect on the ability of having foreign investment uh and capital formation in india 
as well as allowing uh, the Indian people to be able to take advantage of new technologies. Uh, clearly, as everyone has uh, noted before, the commitment to democracy, uh, the com deep commitment uh, to a multi-stakeholder approach to decision making in which the government has sought input uh, not only from, uh, from Indian constituencies but from a global one I think has been very important. Uh, my colleague Dick Beard uh, led a meeting, uh, a workshop here uh, a day or so ago uh, and I think one of the uh, outputs of that workshop which looked globally at issues of trade and the like was uh, noted that uh, the great progress that India has made in these areas but I would note that uh, there are, were concerns expressed there and elsewhere about uh, not only in India but in other countries as well towards uh, localization. So what I'm hopeful for is that we will see in the future that which has brought India such great uh, benefits in the recent decade or so, which is a very global view, a welcoming view, uh, a view that it looks to industry, the private sector generally, uh, academia, civil society, uh, and of course government uh, to attract the sort of investment and entrepreneurial uh, uh, enthusiasm that has generated so many benefits for the Indian people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I, uh, there was a hand up, a question from the floor. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, Please identify yourself and then... Of course. Question. My name is Max Engels. I work for Google in Germany. Um, we hear quite uh, or very good things about the multi-stakeholder approach in India. Um, we have heard quite interesting, or we, we know there's quite interesting uh, developments in Brazil when it comes to institutionalizing the um, multi-stakeholder approach on a national level. And uh, I was wondering what um, kind of similar um, institutional setups and uh, um, yeah, committees you have um, in India, and um, if possible, if any one of the panelists could comment on um, the idea of developing internet governance principles as has been discussed yesterday at the main session. So let me um, respond, to, because the government can always give you, the, you know, the, the story, but let me tell you as private sector what we think is a true multi-stakeholder approach and how they have institutionalized it and how we participated in it and how it's an open process. Um, we've had three national telecom policies. Each one of them are put out for comments on the net. And based on the comments received, and they, they, you can imagine in India there can be millions of comments, the national telecom policies formulated. The first one was not based on comments because it was the opening up of the sector in 1994, but in, 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 in 1999 and in 2012, last year, it was done through a public process. Um, we've actually, uh, I believe we've done better than what Brazil uh, claims to have done, which is uh, the TRAI Act, which is the Telecommunications Act in India, under Section 14, actually, uh, well, under Section 11, uh, uh, mandates the regulator to work in a transparent manner, which means all comments are invited in writing, open houses are held, all comments are put online, you're allowed to buttress those comments, and the final decisions are put out again online with copies to the government. And this is by way of a recommendation or an order based on what the mandates are. Parties who are not happy with the decisions of the TRAI or resultant decisions from the government are not only allowed to oppose it, but actually can take it to court and have it offset if they believe and they can prove that inputs that were provided which were meaningful have either been ignored or the decisions are made contrary. So the robust process that exists for multi-stakeholders to participate actually in the decision making is embedded in law, which is far stronger than a committee or a bunch of people who've been um, sort of put in that position. Um, the DIT has also just begun uh, the process of setting up an India MAG, which has about 35 members. And these are multi-stakeholder groups, um, and they hope to hold the first India IGF at some stage in the near future. 
that's again a true multi-stakeholder approach. Now, the process of selection and all that will evolve as it starts, but the, on day one, there are 35 which are equally divided between, in fact, the government is the smallest stakeholder. The biggest stakeholder in that is industry, civil society is really large, academia is big, um, um, and, and, and media. So everybody's in that group, and it's an open process again. So I can, I can go on, but I think both by way of practice, which are the policies, way of internet governance, which is the, uh, uh, the, the MAC that is the government has set up, and in terms of law where telecom regulations is concerned, which leads to on, which also includes internet and broadband, by the way, it is embedded in law and you have the right to appeal in law. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Uh, further to what Mr. Brad said, I would like to say that we do have a truly PPP model in the country. As uh, Brad pointed out, uh, uh, while forming, forming up the National Telecom Policy 2012, it took more than a year's time in forming it up. Why? Why? We do have around uh, 12 meetings with the multi-stakeholders group. The questions, the queries were received for more than six months from the public. And once we have received queries, questions, and all issues, those were sent to all the central government, state government, and all multi-stakeholders group. So basically taking inputs from all the stakeholders, discussing with them, and then coming out with the uh, points which we want to have in policy. And in case if we want to don't have some points, <coughs> yes, we do have discussions with the stakeholders those points are not considered. So this is the truly policy uh, conforming the multi-stakeholders group. And on the similar fashion, we do have IPv6 implementation in the country. I think India was perhaps the first country in the world who has come up, while government have come up with such a, such a clear mandate for all stakeholders in the country. And of course, we do have uh, representation from all stakeholders whether it's a civil society, whether it's a academia, whether, whether it's a industry. So we do have three level committees and all things are discussed, decided and then implemented in truly manner. And on a similar fashion, we are going for the M2M policy implementations. So definitely we do have things and we uh, invite all stakeholders. It is not limited to the only associations. We invite comments from public and whatever comments are valuable, those are considered. And uh, definitely, uh, we would like to associate with the countries who want to uh, uh, cooperate with India. And of course, we are always they are always welcome um, to be part of our groups also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for reaffirming your commitment to this process of multi-stakeholderism. I know with India, it's always a challenge. You can be representative, but can you be truly participatory? That is the way forward. I want to now call on our distinguished colleague from uh, from Sri Lanka, Rohan Samarajive. Rohan, um, there's just so much learning from a regulator and to be working in circumstances such as ours. If you could please share the story. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I speak uh, not really as a Sri Lankan, but uh, as somebody who runs a regional think tank, which has been engaging with uh, Indian public policy issues for a long time. Uh, I have two concerns. I, I think the, the NOFN is, uh, is, uh, is an excellent initiative, but there is a certain historical backdrop that worries me, which is that the government-owned BSNL actually had a huge amount of fiber uh, backhaul in the country that it refused to share with all the other operators all these years. So my concern uh, that I have actually raised in my interactions with uh, Indian, uh, with DOT, has been uh, it is very, very important that we have a uh, good, non-discriminatory, cost-oriented uh, access regime so that the other operators will be able to use it uh, as it, the government intends. Uh, because whatever said and done, NOFN is a government-operated, uh, government-owned entity, which, for example, does not have any private sector uh, participation in the management of, of it, uh, as one would expect in, in, uh, in light of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, and we do have the examples of places like Kenya and Colombia, where in fact the government has, has built out or is building out uh, fiber optic uh, cables, fiber optic networks with the money raised from telecommunications subscribers, as in India, 
where the private sector just doesn't use it because the transaction costs, the, the uh, payments, the procedures are too complex and unattractive. The second point I wish to raise is something I, I uh, submitted uh, as a formal response to your national telecom policy, uh, which was the whole question of defining what broadband actually is. Uh, in many countries, uh, we have a, a practice of defining advertised rates. So we keep saying 2 MB, 5 MB, various things. But we as a research organization in collaboration with IIT Madras, our colleagues at IIT Madras, we have actually tested in a large number of uh, Indian cities and we find that what is promised is not delivered by fixed as well as mobile operators. So the question is, are you going to define this whole business on what people promise or I do, are you going to have a mechanism to make sure that there is some kind of uh, assurance that uh, when somebody is delivering, uh, when we are talking about 2 MB, I honestly think 2 MB might be too high at this stage, but whatever they are promising, that it is delivered. Because we are, we are seeing even 512 is not delivered in a large number of locations. So those are my two suggestions. I hope they will be taken. Uh, as constructive because we are, as a research organization, uh, India is one of our primary areas of interaction and we are very keen to contribute uh, from our perspective to the success of uh, India's broadband uh, plans. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you so much. May I request Vikram to please respond? Rohan, as always, you're so good. Right. Okay, to the two uh, specific points that you raise about the fiber access. So the National Optical Fiber Network clearly uh, saw that the BSNL fiber was not being able to deliver the national requirement. So the NOFN project actually integrates, uh, it's about incremental fiber existing and then you need to add on to that. So if the BSNL existed this place, it is to lay and extend it to the uh, village panchayat or the district, uh, you know, the headquarters. In addition to BSNL, they've also got the other people in the, uh, so they've got power grid corporation, the rail grid corporation. And we have a commitment from the government that this will be open access. So uh, to, to your point that, you know, okay, BSNL wanted to monetize heavily, of what they had and a lot of fiber was dark fiber so those days we see are over and having uh, been through that it's going to be more open access and available to anybody who wants to actually utilize uh, uh, through the optical fiber network in fact as part of the pilots it was provided free of cost there were three pilots in uh, three uh, three uh, panchayat locations to your second point about the definition of broadband, as later just last, uh, just uh, maybe last 15 days or so, uh, it's been redefined by a Gazette of India notification to 512. It specifies for wireline and wireless. Uh, yes, there are challenges around what you, uh, what a customer actually receives. So there is a lot of debate between uh, quality of experience versus quality of service because this comes between quality of experience and quality of service. So we all, especially our members as service providers who are predominantly the people providing uh, that service. So most people do not advertise it as broadband, but as high speed internet access. Okay. So uh, yes, there is more work to be done. Part of the challenges in that is, is what I mentioned earlier is the amount of spectrum that you hold and how many people you can put through that uh, 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 through that pipe and you know what is the quality of experience you get at the other end. So um, we all, both the private industry as the government, both are cognizant of you know definitions so to say, but in the national telecom policy they've already made progress by moving up to 512. And there's also a commitment in the policy itself to go to 2 meg. So as our networks expand, you know, so uh, what we foresee is in the January auctions, potentially we should be getting more 3G uh, uh, spectrum bands. So a 
an operator can possibly become a pan India 3G operator, no, except for BSNL, nobody else is there as pan India and BWA only one company is there. So the, you know the, it's it's moving up. So it's not that we uh, don't have an eye on that ball. Yes, we have an eye on that ball, and I'm sure the game will play itself out well. Yeah. Show show to respond in that. Uh, exactly the same discussion we did in Japan back in 2000. Uh, before 2000, Japan was a very large, you know, a slow internet, very expensive. Then we investigate the uh, detail about NTT's infrastructure. Also, in, in parallel, we let use such an infrastructure based on the, uh, you know, um, such a uh, policy. The other interesting is the uh, based on such a destruction of the uh, infrastructure, the NTT is going to purely private sector, basically. Then they significantly install the fiber system after 2000, meaning the private, you know, the privatization of such an infrastructure people is very important in order to satisfy the requirement by the user, as, as he mentioned. So uh, exactly the same discussion, how much bandwidth is required for the broadband. Now that is defined by user, not by provider. Thank you so much. Pranesh, can I turn to you from the Center for Internet and Society, one of the leading voices in floating conversations in India? Thank you, Pranesh. Thank you very much, Savi. Uh, I'd like to, to thank the panel, uh, which has been quite, uh, quite enlightening. And uh, just like to note that, uh, that the National Telecom Policy uh, 2012 uh, get, hits the right, right notes in so many places, including, for instance, by talking about the National Optic Fiber Network as being uh, open access, non-discriminatory, and technology neutral. Uh, and that uh, has many good things to say about spectrum management uh, as well. Uh, section 4.9 of the policy talks about investigating uh, white space uh, reuse. Uh, 4.6 talks about uh, unlicensed spectrum. 4.2 talks about increased audits of uh, current uh, spectrum. And, uh, and, and so I'd, one question would be, uh, so what's, what are the next steps that are happening along these fronts? Uh, the second point I want to raise is on, on uh, IPR. So um, while uh, one part of it, section 4.7, talks about indigenous development of technologies, and uh, otherwise in another part of the uh, policy talks about generating uh, IPR locally being very important, uh, that's something that the Indian industry and the Indian government haven't uh, been able to focus on uh, the way, for instance, the Chinese government has. Uh, they've taken this issue very seriously and have, uh, have led standards development processes there uh, to, uh, in some cases, circumvent existing patents, in other cases, to develop indigenous technologies. So, uh, and, and this is something that we at the Center for Internet and Society do a fair amount of research on. The third issue uh, I wanted to bring up was uh, that highlighted by Virat when he spoke about multi-stakeholderism, right? Uh, he spoke about TRI, but in 2000 itself, the IT Act contained Section 88, which before all discussions of multi-stakeholderism, put in place uh, an expert uh, body from multiple uh, interest uh, viewpoints, uh, multiple stakeholders, to advise the government on how to actually uh, implement and change and, and on uh, issues of, of uh, cyber regulation. But uh, that has never actually gone forward. So my question would be, with the ma like, what exactly with the relationship between that provision, which is there in law, and the new MAG B, and and why that hasn't, uh, where whereas we've done well in the telecom sector, why we haven't done as well in the internet regulation uh, part of multi-stakeholderism. Thank you so much. I think uh, thank you for those questions, Pranish. Um, that really does structure our discussion and takes the conversation further. May I request uh, Mr. Agarwal to please respond to the first part, and if Vikram could come in on the yeah. second and Virat on the third one. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Subi, and thank you, Pranesh, for raising these questions. Of course, uh, NTP 12, National Telecom Policy 12, uh, of course, uh, says so many things, uh, indicates so many things, including. Yeah. 
सॉरी फॉर द इनकनवीनियंस एंड ऑफ कोर्स एज यू नो नेशनल टेलीकॉम पॉलिसी ट्वेल्व इज ए बिग डॉक्यूमेंट एंड ऑफ कोर्स इट इज अ रोड मैप फॉर टेलीकॉम इन द कंट्री फॉर नेक्स्ट टेन ईयर्स एंड गवर्नमेंट इज गोइंग अहेड विद इट्स इंप्लीमेंटेशन इन अ फुल प्लान मैनर लेट मी प्रीव यू वॉट स्टेप्स गवर्नमेंट हैव टेकन टिल डेट वी हैव इंडिकेटेड की यस यूनिफाइड लाइसेंसिंग वुड बी डन सो नाउ दिस यूनिफाइड लाइसेंसिंग प्लान इज ऑलरेडी देयर एंड इट इज गोइंग टू बी रिलीज वेरी शॉर्टली एंड ऑफ कोर्स एज फार एज ग्रीन ग्रीन टेलीकॉम पॉलिसी इज देयर इट हैज ऑलरेडी बीन रिलीज बाय द गवर्नमेंट एंड स्पेक्ट्रम मैनेजमेंट तो ऑफ कोर्स वन स्पेक्ट्रम मैनेजमेंट इंस्टीट्यूट इज कमिंग अप एंड गवर्नमेंट इज डी लाइसेंसिंग सम पार्ट ऑफ द फ्रिक्वेंसीज ऑल्सो एंड एज फार एज आई मस्ट से कि क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग सर्विसेज मशीन टू मशीन कम्युनिकेशन आई पी वी सिक्स इंप्लीमेंटेशन आर कंसर्न सो ऑन एम टू एम वी आर कमिंग अप विद द पॉलिसी फॉर्मुलेशन इन नेक्स्ट सिक्स मंथ्स टाइम विद इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ ऑल मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर्स आई मस्ट अप्रिशिएट द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एफर्ट्स कि बिकॉज ये स्टडी आई हैव बीन टू दिस हॉल एंड ऑल बिग गाय फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड वॉज सिटिंग इन ऑन एम टू एम पॉलिसी फॉर्मुलेशन एंड आई थिंक इंडिया वॉज द फर्स्ट कंट्री हु हैव टेकन इनिशिएटिव ऑन पॉलिसी फॉर्मुलेशन एंड आई मस्ट से कि ईच एंड एवरी कंट्री इज डूइंग इन आइसोलेशन एंड दे आर नॉट गोइंग फॉर द इंटर ऑपरेबिलिटी दे आर नॉट गोइंग फॉर द आई पी बेस्ड सिस्टम सो दिस पॉइंट वॉज taken very well by the um, persons and they have invited uh, government of india participation in those meetings and uh, as far as cloud services are concerned so it's a um, cloud services are uh, distributed uh, th- type of things which uh, dit dot and tri are involved so dit have already come out uh, with some a document uh, uh, cloud uh, services for state government central government and as far as telecom service provider part is concerned so dot has referred this case to the uh, try and we are going to have this policy for the telecom network part in next 6 uh, to 8 months time so government is very well seized of all the issues we are having complete review of the policy uh, policy on ntp as per ntp 12 on regular basis secretary telecom is reviewing these things and as per road map it will be implemented so i won't be taking much time now over to vikram uh, sir uh one is like two three i'll come straight uh, to the three points you raised one is about the issues related to spectrum as part of the ntp right so yes white spaces unlicensed uh, audits now one thing maybe it will be of interest to you the ntp has an action plan which is on the website where they break it down as to which month through the year who has to do what one major move forward like i mentioned earlier is the spectrum auction so as part of spectrum management you've got a kitty of spectrum which is available to the government which is lying you know with different stakeholders and users now nationally speaking how do you put it to the best use okay so out of the licenses that were cancelled plus additional some realignment with defense much of this has actually just yesterday the trai has reverted back to the queries of the De- department of telecom right so spectrum management of course especially from our point of view as mobile service operators our view point is if you've got an available national resource you have to see what best use you can put it to uh, for providing services to the citizens if the security of the country for example for defense or space or broadcasting i mean these are the traditional stakeholders who use spectrum so that review process is very important and now that the supreme court has said you will have auctions so the value of spectrum even as it is attributed to non commercial users must also be put out in the public domain if there is a amount of spectrum lying with the railways with space with the uh, aviation authority because ultimately the country is paying for that or accounting for it in some manner so that is part of your spectrum audit right in fact the latest one which you would see is that we as coi have been pushing for a realignment between defense existing 150 megahertz with a small tweaking where you can get more 3g so that's part of the effort okay to your second question about the ecosystem so there are two parts in that one is the ipr and the other is the manufacturing the manufacturing often gets linked to ipr now ipr has its own ecosystem and i don't think it's correct to link it to a manufacturing ecosystem 
So we, from our, uh, you know, from the industry side, there is now a standing committee called the Telecom Equipment Manufacturing Council, where we are providing some inputs to help develop the domestic manufacturing ecosystem. IPR on the other hand, there is another specific report which has got a lot of involvement of the academics and the IIT professors and other folks who have given in their recommendations to develop IPR and innovation and, you know, this stuff. So, uh, yes, like somebody else also said, they, uh, the, uh, Sanjay had said that the parallel with China, but there is no, you know, no undermining the need to develop both the manufacturing and the IPR ecosystem. But then today, many IPRs are actually develop, developed by global teams. Now the question is, where do you register it and who draws the rights and how does it get monetized? That's the moot question, right? So that, that's something which is, you know, uh, all the time discussed and, you know, what is the best answer? I can't really give it. But yes, uh, it, it is part of something which is in focus. And to your third uh, question, uh, I'll hand it over to Virat regarding the IT Act. So, I, you know, on the IPR part, I wish the, the IT industry was here. They're sort of represented a little less, but as you know, it's a very vibrant industry, and really they have to lead the efforts there. Um, on the last piece, which is um, about the committee and uh, MAG, um, as you're aware, when the meetings occurred last November, when the committee was actually called, um, even though it doesn't have everybody on it, when the actual meeting occurred, the minister had called civil society, academy, everybody in the room to have a discussion, and that lasted almost an hour and a half, and then we know what transpired after that. So I said in practice, I think uh, their, uh, the, the performance has been much better than what the optics of the committee look like. but. As far as MAG is concerned, I'm not sure what the link between that and the legislation is, but I'm sure the MAG, which your um, which CIS is an invited member of, I think will uh, develop the agenda after it meets. I think the first meeting will be the sort of important meeting to lay out what some of the priorities will be. So I suppose it will take it from there. Um, Omar, can I request you to make your intervention? Uh, thank you very much. So we, first of all, I'd like to congratulate India for uh, the, the development uh, uh, in the progress. And um, uh, that is like an example for other countries uh, to, to follow. Uh, my name is Umar Ansari, and I'm uh, working with the Afghanistan uh, National ICT Alliance. Um, you know Afghanistan is a mountainous country. Um, uh, we have some uh, some flat land as well, but most of uh, the country is mountainous. And uh, there are areas in Afghanistan, although the government claims that 85% of the, uh, the um, uh, residential areas are covered, um, but still uh, there are areas that people uh, have mobile phones, but they, uh, they don't have the, the, the signal in their villages. They go to the top of the mountain and uh, to get a signal and make a call and come back and come down. Uh, that That's making the communication very difficult for us and it's just for making a call. They cannot receive a call because they don't know when the call will be received so they can go uh, up to the mountain. Um, uh, my question is, uh, were there challenges like that in India? And if so, how uh, you address, or if they are still, how, how are you um, addressing it? The, the second part of my question is, um, um, with the internet, Afghanistan is uh, uh, not doing well. The coverage, um, uh, 3G also, uh, they have, they have licensed like four. Uh, for uh, operators with a 3G um, uh, license, um, and it's just started, it's not a year old. Um, only 8% of the population uh, 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 is, is uh, uh, internet sub subscribers. That makes t 2 million out of the 30 million population. Uh, we don't have um, an internet exchange point, and uh, it's it's really difficult and expensive as well, unaffordable for the population. And uh, the other major issue uh, with the. Uh, 
people not uh, using internet is they don't know the language, uh, the applications uh, in the content. Uh, as the uh, chairman of the ISP Association said, we Afghans only, uh, especially the rural areas, only know the green and red button style. Um, how we can cooperate between the content industries? Fourth, uh, third part of my question, wait. <laughs> That's uh, the spectrum issue. Uh, we have 65 TV channels, uh, uh, half of them are in Kabul. Um, and uh, we have 174 radio channels, uh, 74 of them, uh, sorry, uh, 47 of them are Kabul based and 127 are in uh, outside Kabul. 21 TV channels are, uh, were in, in 27 radio channels are waiting for a response because um, uh, the, the frequency spectrum, uh, it's, uh, especially Kabul, it's out of frequency spectrum. Uh, did you have channel, channel uh, challenges like that? If so, thank you. Uh, what thank you, Omar. Uh, you've been a great friend and an ally, and I know you work in exceptionally difficult circumstances, very daunting. Most of us would give up the fight, but you keep the fact flying. I'll just respond very briefly to the last part of your question. Uh, we have a public service broadcasting trust. We have a network. There is the Prasar Bharti Cooperation, and we believe from a developing country perspective, both for identifying key issues and for articulating multiplicity of voices and plurality and diversity and representing the voices of those whose voices are often not heard and those who are not in the room, the public service broadcaster indeed has a great role to play. We've seen about 900 channels, 450 daily news channels. Um, it is phenomenal. Uh, it's almost like going to a mall and, and looking at washing powders with X enzymes and Y enzymes. We know when corporatization happens of the media, there are issues and challenges and voices get left out. Yes, there are opportunities of alliance and we will certainly take that conversation forward. As far as obstacles to access, I think that's, that's a different panel all together and we could go on for another hour and a half. It's been a wonderful session. Before we take the final comments and, and take questions across the floor, we'll have time for one more interaction. Martin, can I briefly request you to share the India experience? You've only just come back and I know it can be a little overwhelming, but you had a lot of things to say, so can I request you to come in, please? I'll go to the microphone rather than the microphone coming to me, I think. Uh, Martin Boyle from nominet.uk uh, um, and um, from somebody from a small island with a small population uh, coming into India, a large country with a very large population. It's, um, it's actually quite daunting, really. Um, but certainly from where... I was, I came away with a very positive message, a very clear message that here was India um, doing a lot of very important enabling work um, that uh, was going to um, see India very well prepared for uh, the next 10 years. Uh, and I came away very, very encouraged by that. You know, I thought that I, I greatly welcomed uh, seeing that. Um, I think, though, from uh, a linguistically challenged country, uh, going to a country with 28 languages and 22 scripts, uh, what came out really clearly to me uh, was the importance of um, finding new ways of communicating between peoples uh, within the country. And, of course, that is something that then is globally applicable because, um, you know, you can do internally, nationally, uh, and then um, the rest of the world can see how you can build those bridges between the different communities. Um, and it's, I think, particularly important because it probably also means that you have to move away from an internet that is very largely written text 
into applications that are very much more focused on speech and video. So the importance of your infrastructure, uh, of getting the fiber out, of getting the handheld devices out. The thought that I was left with, though, was that you're focusing a lot of attention on that uh, infrastructure development. Uh, but I'm hearing a lot less about, yes, but what about the applications? What about uh, the people in the field? And the two words I wrote down um, were uh, skills um, and um, also stimulating the demand in the rural community because uh, the applications are doing something that supports the local community, supports uh, the local economy, uh, and then also supports the development of the Indian economy more globally. So I'd, I'd like to hear something uh, a bit on that, uh, if, uh, if you could, please. Subi. I recognize everyone from the floor. Um, I'm sorry, we're really running behind time. Um, we really, really, really welcome uh, your participation, but we're going to keep the floor for wrap up now and only Twitter comments. Mr. Charya, uh, 140 characters. Yeah. Uh, just I'm responding to the Martin. If we will not hear the story of the internet from the mouth of the father of the internet of India, that the erstwhile with this Sanchar Nigam Limited and now Tata Communication. Neeraj Sonkar is here. To say of, of course, of course. Uh, uh, thanks Rajesh, uh, appreciate that and it's a great privilege and honor to be here listening to the panelists and speakers. So I think, you know, uh, like mobile industry, the way mobile phone has seen a growth, a tremendous growth in India. If I go back uh, historically in 95, we launched internet with 64 KB first. When we speak at this point of time, we have like 1,000 gig of capacity being exchanged on our, on our international gateway across multiple operators in India. So that's a very stunning story. We have all the content guys sitting in India, degrees like Google and, and Yahoo participating there. So I think we have content story. Great job done by Nixie and ISPI, Nixie from Interconnect and exchange of traffic locally in India. We're seeing a lot of uh, applications coming up. Interestingly, from a data communication point of view, uh, there was a time when we kind of requesting all the carriers to kind of exchange traffic. We are like fourth largest IP transit backbone in the world actually. And if I look at wholesale voice, we carry, we are number one wholesale voice carrier and 40 to 60 percent traffic is voice over IP. So India has really come out you know, in a big way, but uh, coming back to the question which was originally raised by one of the uh, speaker here on, on, on the, on the, on the uh, quality of services, 64 kbps to 512 and 2 Mbps. I think looking at the 4G story and the wireless story, the way NFON is trying to drive the long distance fiber story, I think given the right of the issues and uh, right of issues in the metros, the access remains a big challenge. One of the key learning is the highway authority, they created a common trench where operators are allowed to pull the ducts on the national highway. I think India needs to evolve and adopt, especially in the metros. Uh, make a cleaner story in terms of creating Thank you, thank you Mr. Sarkar. We really appreciate you, you taking thank the you. time and joining us. We are really running out of time. Um, can I request the panelists to just make Twitter comments, just wrap up th thoughts in about 30 seconds and then I'd like request Mr. Agarwal to please present the vote of thanks. I thank the audience for being with us. It's been a very engaging, very lively discussion. Over to the panelists. We'll start with my far right. Can I, can I request the professor to please come in? Well, you know, that kind of discussion is quite important. Also, sharing among the multiple countries is quite important. I, I really appreciate the respect in the, uh, the Indian government policy, including the overseas opinions you are going, going to include in, in, in the discussion start this very good action you you you, con you should continue thank you okay uh, first two martins uh, two point the skill development the, the development of the applications apart from the in the local languages i i, I we have a, a lot of such applications going around in the various states of the country where you know e-governance applications in the land records in the local you know uh, educational sector health sector agriculture sector which are developing in a massive way and people are going into those kind of localized applications specific to those 
caste and communities in the country. Secondly, the, this panel discussion, India is a great country with a lot of challenges, the tide, uh, poverty, diversity, languages, and all those things. So, but we have all the ecosystem, all the you know, languages, all the knowledge, which will help us to move forward to the next billion in this country. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Dr. So I'm going to come to you last. I'll exercise the privilege of the chair. Can I request Vikram to please make his intervention? Final comments. Quick one, says, uh, from the mobile operator side, you know, there are two parts. One is, when you're online, there are lots of rural people who, uh, you know, to uh, the comment from Afghanistan and there was uh, from Rajesh as well. The people are smart. Nobody taught them how to use a mobile phone. They were self-learning. Is a, is a big thing even on a smartphone or even on a laptop. We've had a, a, a very good experience. Uh, NIIT had, you know, not uh, what was it, uh, uh, PC in the whole kind of a concept, yeah, yeah. Uh, PC in the wall type of concept. So uh, you provide them access. The rural people, local people, non-English knowing people, they are smart guys, uh, and we have numerous examples of these. Coupled with uh, the really cost, uh, you know, lowering of cost on memory chips. So if you go to a local village shop, he's got a bowl full of chips with movies on it because people don't want, uh, you know, regularly online. They just take the chip, plug in, see the movie, change the chip. The same is now getting applied to health applications, to education. So uh, to the point about uh, allowing the people to innovate, even if they have limited internet access, the demand will build up to have regular 24-7 access. So that's uh, one of the things uh, I thought I'd leave behind. I'll yield my time to uh, the government um, spokesperson. I just want to say that I think we have a long way to go before we sleep. Thank you so much. And the woods are indeed lovely, dark and deep. I now switch hats, but um, thank you, audience. I really do want to thank you once again. And thank you, Government of India, for making the time to be here and making this engagement possible. To you, Mr. Agarwal. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Subi. Uh, basically, to connect uh, unconnected ones, one billion people of the country, so we need to create the economic value, the way we have created for the 900 uh, million plus mobile phones. Basically, it is not the issues. It is basically creation of the economic value so that the people may be interested in really data services. So we need to make bridges to connect the unconnected ones. We need to make the bridges from urban to rural areas. And for that, government of India is really uh, worried and we are coming out with so many uh, pilot projects, uh, applications, so that economic values may be created. Through IPv6 adoptions, through machine-to-machine -machine communications adoptions, we are trying to have some applications, some projects, so that each and every part, each and every sector of the economy uh, may be targeted, like Japan. That's why we have invited Japan on our panel. They have tried, they have reduced energy requirement to the extent of 35% by adoption of these new technologies. They have. Uh, in, when we had uh, tsunami in Japan, they have tried to overcome with tsunami in just uh, less than one year's time. So definitely we do have a country with similar type of situations, but definitely we are issues, more issues than the solutions to so with new technology adoptions. We try to make India like that uh, developed country. And of course, through economic value creation, uh, connected, con to connect the unconnected ones is not possible and definitely uh, with the participation of panelists, with the involvement of the complete uh, house in this uh, forum, uh, this seems to be possible. And of course, 600 uh, million uh, mobile phones, uh, sorry, broadband connections uh, is the next target. But definitely before that, we would be having uh, 1 billion internet connections with our India networks. And of course, I am really very thankful uh, to Ms. Subi as a moderator, Mr. Birag Bhatia, of course, uh, all other panelists, especially uh, Mr. Hiroshi Isaki, who has especially come to attend this panel from Japan, from Tokyo. He is flying today evening itself. He has come to, uh, today morning itself. Just for this panel, he has been with us.
and of course Mr. Sanjia and of course all the uh, important persons from India and abroad. Though this panel was very short, we could not take many people, many important people on the panel, but definitely your contributions are very, very important uh, to the country and India needs you and of course we are for you. Thank you. Thank you Thank very much. You so and of course much. final, final word to the IGF Secretariat to give us a chance to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just before we wrap up a little note. As, as, as you walk away and to, to the question that Martin had asked about you know, the local content and the killer applications, we believe that the killer applications for masses in India will be the Bollywood content to be put out. I think that will drive the usage to begin with. So as you walk out of this place um, and you think about what India is going to do next, enjoy this and have lunch. <laughs>